Good afternoon, you're watching the English newscast on Future Television. I'm Yumna Nofa and these are today's top stories. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry underlines the pledge his country made towards assisting Lebanon in tackling its refugee crises. The 17-nation International Syria Support Group to renew its call for a nationwide ceasefire and immediate humanitarian access to besieged areas in Syria. And Yemen's government suspends its participation in talks with Iran-backed rebels for the second time this month. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is underlining the pledge his country made during the London Donors Conference on Refugees towards assisting Lebanon in tackling the burden. Kerry made his stance in a letter to Prime Minister Tamam Salam that was delivered by the U.S. Embassy Chargé d'Affaires at Interim Danny Hall during talks held at the Grand Sarai. The letter expressed American commitment to helping Lebanon cope with the presence of over one million displaced Syrians. At the Syria Donors Conference in London on February 4th, the U.S. announced over $133 million in emergency humanitarian assistance to support Syrian refugees and their host communities in Lebanon. These resources have already helped communities vaccinate children and improve access to safe water, among other projects. French Ambassador to Lebanon Emmanuel Bonne is denying reports that an upcoming conference in France centers on Lebanon's presidential vacuum. Speaking to LBC, Bonne said that a misunderstanding had occurred over what the conference will highlight, clarifying that it was not over Lebanon's current power void. He had said a day earlier that the upcoming visit by Foreign Minister Jean-Marc Ayrault to Lebanon was aimed at preparing for an international conference to help resolve the country's constitutional and political crises. Several municipal councils and Mukhtars are running unopposed in the upcoming South Lebanon in Nabati elections have been re-elected by acclamation. Dozens of additional and municipal election candidates in different towns and villages across South Lebanon announced their victories by acclamation over the past week. Elections are set to take place in the South Lebanon and Nabatiye governorates on May 22nd in the third round of municipal polls in the country. The first round was held in Beirut, the Baka Valley and Balba Kermel district on May 8th. The second round took place in Mount Lebanon on Sunday and the fourth is scheduled on May 29th in northern Lebanon and Akkar. Health Minister Wael Abu Faoud is urging judicial and security authorities to put an end to the common phenomenon of celebratory gunfire across the country. He said that the destiny of a Lebanese is to die because of joy, criticizing politicians for covering up for those behind the events. He cited several incidents that occurred pa over the past weeks, including the death of 16-year-old Ahmed Ibrahim, who was killed in the Baqa Valley by celebratory gunfire, and 15-year-old Hussein Azib, who also survived a similar incident in Beirut's southern suburbs. Automatic weapons could be heard firing in many areas last Sunday night as the initial results on Mount Lebanon's municipal and local government officials' polls were being issued. Death and injury by stray bullets from celebratory gunfire are not an uncommon thing in Lebanon. The latest local polls greatly shuffled political alliances in Lebanon and toppled the so-called March 8 and 14 alliances, according to former Qatar party chief Amin Jmail. He said this in remarks, adding that the first and second rounds of municipal polls confused all the foundations of the political conflict that have existed in the country since 2005. The municipal elections, the first democratic polls to be staged since 2010, are widely seen as crucial for preserving equal power sharing between Muslims and Christians. Turning to the power void and parliament paralysis, Shmayil stressed the necessity to elect a new head of state and activate state institutions. Lebanon has been without a head of state since the tenor of President Michel Slaiman ended in May 2014, and the parliament extended its term by two years in November 2014 over what it said was security concerns. Germany's Foreign Minister Frank Walk Steinmeier states that major power talks in Syria aim to restore a truce across the country and get aid into besieged areas to encourage opposition groups to return to negotiations in Geneva. He adds that the talks are about improving the conditions for ceasefire and humanitarian aid, 
so as to win the opposition over the negotiations with the regime in the meeting backed by 17 countries, which include Lebanon. The 17-nation International Syria Support Group will renew its call for a nationwide ceasefire and immediate humanitarian access to besieged areas. A recent surge in bloodshed in Aleppo, Syria's largest city before the war, wrecked the partial truce sponsored by Washington and Moscow that had allowed UN-brokered peace talks to convene in Geneva. The talks collapsed last month after the opposition walked away following an increase in violence. Coming up next, French President François Hollande tells Europe on Radio that driving through labor reforms aimed at delivering jobs is more important than presidential popularity. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching the 1620 o'clock news here on Future Television. Yemen's government suspends its participation in talks with Iran-backed troubles for the second time this month, according to the foreign ministry, in a new setback to the UN-backed peace process. Abdel Malik El Mikhlafi said on Twitter that the Houthi Shia militias who control the capital had torpedoed the talks completely by backtracking on their commitments after a month of negotiations. In particular, the government wants the Houthis to comply with a UN Security Council resolution ordering them to pull out of territory they had occupied in a 2014 offensive and surrender heavy arms they captured. Sources close to the government and the rebel delegations confirmed that a session scheduled to take place m this morning was canceled after the government delegation withdrew. The United Nations estimates that more than 6,400 people have been killed and 2.8 million displaced in Yemen since March of last year. The U.S. Agency for International Development launched a new initiative to support Gaza's agriculture sector in Palestine. The scheme, Envision Gaza 2020, will provide humanitarian assistance to farmers, as well as increased job opportunities and training, and help with marketing and distributing food produce. The U.S. Consul General in Jerusalem, Donald A. Bloom, announced the scheme at the Grown a Gaza event, which brought together farmers and local policymakers to highlight Gaza's farming industry. The USAID is investing $50 million in Envision Gaza 2020. However, a devastating 2014 war between Palestinian militants and Israel, the border restrictions imposed by Israel and Egypt, and the destruction of cross-border smuggling tunnels by an Egyptian government at odds with Gaza's Hamas rulers have all contributed to economic hardship in the territory. Iran's parliament is voting through a law obliging the government to demand damages from the United States for 63 years of hostile action and crimes. The text cites material or moral damage caused by the U.S. during the coup against nationalist leader Mohammad Mossadegh in the Iran-Iraq war in the destruction of oil platforms in the Gulf and espionage against the Islamic Republic. Parliament did not specify a sum, but the vice president said during the debate that Iranian courts have already ruled that the U.S. pays $50 billion in damages for its hostile actions towards the country. The law was passed in a response to a U.S. Supreme Court decision last month where the body ruled that Iran must hand nearly $2 billion in frozen central bank assets to the survivors and relatives of those killed in attacks it has been accused of organizing. Two bombings hit Baghdad in Iraq, killing at least 23 and wounding nearly 50. A suicide bomber in a marketplace in the northern district of Al Shab killed 17 and wounded 8, while a car bomb in the southern neighborhood of Ar Rashid left 6 dead and another 21 wounded. There was no immediate claim for responsibility for the attacks, but Daesh has claimed bombings in and around the capital last week and killed 100 people and sparked popular anger against the government for failing to ensure security. Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi has said a political crisis sparked by his attempt to reshuffle the cabinet in an anti-corruption bid was hampering the fight against Daesh and creating space for more insurgent attacks on the civilian population. French President François Hollande tells Europe One Radio that the battle is not won against unemployment and that driving through labor reforms aimed at delivering jobs is more important than presidential popularity. Hollande is deeply unpopular right now with the French electorate as his government is pushing through labor reforms aimed at making hiring and firing people much easier. The reforms have split his socialist party and drawn people onto the streets and more protests were expected on the first day of a week of strike action. Hollande insists that the law will be passed and that he will not give in. Recent protests have turned violent and some seen as troublemakers by authorities have been banned from demonstrating by a police order.
Soldiers from Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh were killed hours after the Armenian and Azeri presidents agreed on the need for a peaceful settlement to the conflict in the breakaway region where violence flared again last month. A prior meeting between the two presidents in Vienna was the first since fighting between Armenian-backed separatists in Nagorno-Karabakh and Azeri forces restarted. The resurgence in violence has killed dozens of people and pushed relations between the neighbors to their worst in years. A ceasefire agreed a month ago has stopped the short conflict becoming an all-out war, but residents say gunfire and shelling still echo nightly and people are still being killed. A soldier from Nagorno-Karabakh was killed just after midnight as a result of shooting from Azerbaijan's side, while an Azeri soldier was killed in a ceasefire violation. Still, the Cannes Film Festival, the most popular film festival of all year, is still going on. And the cast and crew of Jeff Nichols' latest film, Loving, took to the red carpet in Cannes for the film's premiere. Nichols walked down the red carpet alongside actress Ruth Mega and actor Joel Edgerton, who played the mixed-race couple at the center of the film. The film is based on the true story of a white man and a black woman from Virginia who get married in Washington, D.C. in 1958. When they return home, they are first jailed, then banished because interracial marriage is prohibited in Virginia. They relocate and lawyers take their cause to the U.S. Supreme Court, which rules in 1967 that interracial marriage is unconstitutional, a historic civil rights decision that ends all race-based limits on marriage in the United States. Jeff Nichols, who won critical acclaim for high-anxiety dramas like Midnight Special, defies expectations in loving by focusing on the power of love against all odds rather than clobbering viewers with racial politics. This marks the end of our bulletin for today. Now for a reminder of our top stories. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry underlines pledges his country makes towards assisting Lebanon in tackling its refugee crisis. The 17-nation International Syria Support Group to renew its call for a nationwide ceasefire and immediate humanitarian access to besieged areas in Syria. And Yemen's government suspends its participation in talks with Iran-backed rebels for the second time this month. Those are your Tuesday headlines live on Future Television. I'm Yumna Nofal, wishing you all a good night. Take care. <laughs>